Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, the Ohlendorf Center, Cohn Resnick Accounting, Tax, and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results, the Fidelco Group, Fedway Associates, United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on Earth, and by New Jersey's credit unions, banking you can trust. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. Everything you've ever wanted or needed to know about identity theft, you're about to find out. With an expert, we have uh, Lourdes Cortez, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of North Jersey Federal Credit Union. Good to see you. Thank you, Steve. We were just having a fascinating conversation right before we got on the air. You just taught me an awful lot. Identity theft, how does it happen and how can we prevent it? How does it happen? Yeah, I well, mean, you, you, you just told me people should be shredding their absolutely. monthly statements and I'm thinking, what? I just take mine rip them up and throw them in the garbage and you say, Steve, you can't do that. And I'm thinking, what does that have to do with identity theft? Go ahead. Well, it does. It does because you'd be surprised um, if you don't shred your statements and you just throw them in the garbage. There are people that literally will go through the garbage to get your personal information. So it's really key to discard your statements. <sighs> the pertinent information that you no longer use it needs to be really shredded. What is identity theft? Identity theft is when someone illegally uses your personal information to get credit, mm. to open bank accounts, to impersonate you, really. Get driver's license, passports. But, but Lord, some people are more susceptible than others for this, right? Elderly population and those Absolutely. who are, um, what do you call them, millennials, Jackie? Yes. What does that mean? 20, 20-ish? 20 yes, correct. Who are we talking about? I mean, and why? Why those two populations? Well, I think because the elderly um, a lot of times don't feel the, 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 they don't see the importance of making sure to discard their information. A lot of times, too, you know, they're so um, susceptible to, you know, being, um, for example, I had a situation where a friend of mine got a phone call from a credit card company um, verifying information, and it turned out that her identity was stolen. So um, she didn't realize it. She didn't ask any questions. She just answered the, the questions that were asked, and it turned out that you know the person on the phone was the person that stole her identity and You're just got kidding. additional information. So, you know, my biggest um, tip for that is if you get a phone call from a credit card company, ask them what your password is. Ask them why? What, because then you can verify whether in fact it really is your credit card company that is calling you to verify the last six or five charges on your credit card. How'd you get into this whole field? And you're connected to an organization that we're partners with. Talk right. about that organization. Um, it's North Jersey Federal Credit Union. It's a non-profit uh, organization. It's a cooperative. Right, and also and the, the larger organization, the parent, is right there. We, we have the website right there. Right, the Credit Union League, njfcu.org. Right. And that Credit Union League is all about educating and informing and advocating, right? Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. This is a big field. Well, it's important. You know, um, we believe in people helping people, okay? That, that definitely um, describes who we are. You know, the difference between us and a bank is the mere fact that we care and we are interested in you as an individual. Okay, just wanted to clarify. We're not saying banks don't care. 
Well, you can say what you want. Yeah, We're yeah. not advocating that banks don't care. Right. But you're saying that that's your philosophy, that's your motto, but also you're trying to educate people about identity theft. You're also, also, the other area I know that you're talking a lot about is credit score, which people are clueless right. about. Absolutely. And explain that whole credit score thing, because Absolutely. then there's something called a credit record. Right. What is, what's, what's the difference between a credit report and a credit score? Credit report and credit score. I the thought they were the same thing. Yeah, no, it's two different things. Two different things. Your credit record is a list of all of your credit with your credit card companies, loans, mortgages. Um, it gives you the list of the financial institution. Your credit score is a score that is given to you based on your payment history, how long you've had the credit cards or the mortgages right. um, open, and it's a risk rating that gets calculated based on your outstanding balances, how recent you have opened these accounts. Right. And it basically, that credit score kind of tells the financial institution whether you're a good risk or whether you're a high risk. Big mistakes we make that screw up our credit score, yeah, they include what? Late payments. Um, you know, late payments and also making sure that you, you know, pull your credit report so that you can verify that the information on that credit report is in fact yours. How would I get that? You could get that, it, it, they, all, the major credit cards offer free copies of your credit report. I could say, I wanna see my credit report. You could go online. You could go online, you could just Google Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. All three of them provide you free copies of your credit report. Is it written in a way, Lord, is that I can understand, or is it written in a financial jargon that I'll be sitting there saying, what? I don't get it. Well, I think- Because that's the hard part. Right, no, you, you, you're absolutely correct. I think that the credit card companies are really working towards making it user-friendly. Do they want us to understand? Um, I believe they do, I believe they do, but I also believe that the people that are putting together um, these reports are not necessarily the people on the receiving end. But if you don't ask for them, there's nothing to read. Right, But Correct. you have to be, what you're really saying is you have to be proactive and protect yourself Absolutely. as best you can. Absolutely, you do, you do. And running a credit report, you know, I was saying twice a year, maybe you want to do it once a quarter. It's, it's inexpensive okay. and you know what? It's going to protect Stay on top you. Of it. I got to ask Absolutely. you before you get out of here. Online shopping. Yes. Give me some advice. What well, are the risks? Well, you need to make sure that the websites that you're going in have the little lock at the bottom little of lock. the screen. Yes, it's it's a security lock that they, it's, it has an icon of a lock. Not all of them have it, but there is, um, you know, it does just verify that the um, website that you're purchasing um, on is secure. And you can, they have either, either verify visa the logo on the bottom or the little secure lock on the bottom of the screen. If not? If not, do not shop. Because? Be your information could be compromised. Information could be compromised. This is important stuff. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, because once your identity is compromised, it is so difficult. It's a challenge to really, you know, get your, your identity back. Getting it back. Absolutely. Lourdes Cortez, you've done a great public service. President and CEO, North Jersey Federal Credit Union. Thank you so much for Thank joining you, us. Thank you, Steve. Good Thank stuff. you for having me. Anytime. Okay. Stay with us one-on-one. -on -one. We'll be right back right after this. That was very informative. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by our friend Dana Katzman-Spett, who is executive director of a terrific organization called Pony Power Therapies. Good to see you. Nice to see you too, Steve. We've worked together um, with the Berry Foundation, Russ and Angelica Berry Foundation. You, in 2007, Run, won the Russ Berry Award for Making a Difference. That's correct. And I want you to talk about what Pony Power Therapies is all about, the impact that you make, um, and why you have so much passion for it. 
Uh, Pony Power Therapies uses horses in the farm environment to affect positive change with children and adults with special needs. Um, we have clients as young as two and a half and as old as 80 that participate in programming on our farm. Um, Pony Power is owned and operated uh, in Mawa, New Jersey, where we have uh, 17 program horses, 14 staff, mm. over 100 active volunteers from our community that uh, support 120 to 170 sessions a week on our farm year-round. You know, so interesting, um, because we work with the Berry Foundation for so long, the focus on those awards is on those who make a difference, and extraordinary people who make an extraordinary difference when you find out they're really extraordinary people. And when I first heard about you and I thought, in many ways, it's how people get into these organizations, how they start them. You started the organization because of your own personal experience with your daughter who is now 18. Talk about your daughter, what she faced, and how that motivated you to start this organization. Sure. So I'm a lifelong equestrian. I've had horses since five. I'm also a trained social worker. I have a master's in social work. Right. Um, and I have a child who presented with some very minor special needs with sensory integration uh, when she was about two years old. Sydney. Sydney, that's correct. Um, and through research I came across therapeutic riding as a treatment modality, as an adjunct. So I became certified and really started the program with one horse and four riders. One horse, mm -hmm. four riders. Four said, riders. Okay, let me try, see how this works. See how it worked. I knew it was working for my child. It, it made us happy and it improved her life What was it doing for Sydney? It allowed her to uh, gain the skill uh, that she needed with her sensory processing, and it, it was an immediate fix for her. And it's something that, you know, she's 18 now, and she graduated high school a year early, and her life is fabulous. Um, and it just, it's working for so many others. Could we do, let's take a quick look. Um, Paula Levine, our producer, let's take a quick look at uh, Pony Paris Therapy, and we'll talk it through. Let's take a look. A big part of our client base are individuals on the autistic spectrum, both children and adults, um, individuals with cerebral palsy and other medically fragile um, conditions. Describe the connection between uh, those horses and those kids. Horses are incredible animals. Um, like I said, I've been with horses since I'm five years old and I, I still, every day, am amazed by the animals. They don't communicate with language, they communicate by body language and they are animals of prey so they're constantly responding to their environment. And horses have the ability to interact with humans, they're social. So their behaviors are very similar to human behavior. Um, the benefit when sitting on the back of a horse and if you're in proper position, which requires our three to one ratio of staff or volunteers to rider, the input of the horse is exactly the same as human gait. No machine can repl replicate that. The horse responds to the ground, it sneezes, it moves through space, it's moving your body dynamically. Um, it requires that you're present in the moment, which so few things allow. What so are those kids getting? Those kids are moving their bodies. If you're in a wheelchair, we have children who come to us from the Children's Therapy Center, um, a local organization working with multiply handicapped children. And they're coming from a wheelchair to being on the back of a horse, and their bodies are moving as if they're walking. So it's enhancing all the therapies that are already going on in their life. And it's bringing joy. I mean, how lucky are we at Pony Power that people are experiencing joy? What does it do for you? Uh, I'm very passionate, as you can tell. <laughs> um, it requires, it's a 24-7 job. Horses don't pack up and go home for the weekend and take vacations. So it's a tremendous, Pony Power is a huge operation to manage. Um, 17 horses, two goats, two pigs, three dogs, and a cat um, is a full-time plus position and we're located in Bergen County and so it's a very serious job and we maintain our horse <coughs> herd as if they were superstars, which they are. Where do you get them? All of our horses are either donated or rescued, so it's kind of a win-win for everyone on the farm. 
Um, our horses have been repurposed. They may have had a show career with an injury and they would serve well in our program. We've rescued some from slaughter. We've rescued some from abuse. So they are, I believe, I'm not, I don't speak horse, but my gut feeling is they're grateful to be on the farm as well and they give back to our clients. Where do you get the money? Uh, the money is, it's, it comes from everywhere. We have a fee for service for those who can pay, which covers a portion, not the actual cost. We're constantly <coughs> fundraising um, through private foundations, grant writing. Um, the Rustberry Foundation was instrumental in giving us an award back in 2007. What did that mean? Uh, it, it was validation of our program of Pony Power, that Pony Power is on the right track and that people believe that we're a good investment, which we are and it just continues to allow us to grow. Our program grows daily, the phone rings nonstop. Um, we're looking to expand, we're looking for more property. Uh, our partners in the, in the community continue to grow on a daily basis. <coughs> Let me try this in the time we have left. We, uh, we talk to nonprofit leaders all the time about the challenges of doing this, of running the organization. Um, passion's a big part of it, but the business side of it is always very challenging. Having to, beyond what it is you do that you love, having to go out there and raise the money and being a leader and all those things. Do you love that part of it or do you accept it? Um, I, accepted, <coughs> I accepted it at first and I love it now. I love talking about Pony Power to the community and sharing with the community because I believe 100% on a day-to-day -day basis when I hear from a family of an autistic boy that the time spent on horseback at Pony Power allows the family to have several hours post-riding of, of actual communication face to face and with language because of the movement of the horse. I love Pony Power because the VA hospital in Lyons, New Jersey is sending their uh, women who are in the women's victim unit who have suffered you know, sexual trauma while in the military and the horses are allowing them to talk about appropriate touch and boundaries <coughs> and setting boundaries. Right. And I get to talk about that and by talking to that we bring more, more from the community into the fold to help us fund our program that's so necessary. And if, finally, if people want to help, what do they do? They Put up the website right now. Uh, go to our website, learn about our program, that video you can see in its entirety, and I invite anyone who wants to make an appointment to come see the farm, because it is a hard, it's a hard program to describe because on a daily basis something new is happening, so please make an appointment and come see, volunteer, however you want to get involved, there's a way to get involved. Dan, I want to thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. We meet the winners, we meet the people who participate in the Raspberry Awards, excuse me, um, every year. It's been a lot of years now. And every year we're inspired by the winners who come back like yourself. So thank you for doing what you do and the people you serve. Thank you so much, Steve. Stay with us one-on-one -on -one as I get my voice back <laughs> right after this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D., and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are joined by Dr. Gabriel D. Loazzo, who is uh, the director of the Thoracic Aortic Program at Hackensack University Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Thank you, Steve. Um, it's so fascinating. I was just getting ready for this segment. I started thinking, okay, what is the aorta? Well, the aorta is the big pipe that comes out of the heart. I tell this to my patients. It's like a garden hose. It it's a big pipe that comes out of the top of the heart and it gives blood to all the major organs in the body. It's like, you know, gar the Garden State Parkway. And along the Garden State Parkway, you can have exits. And those exits on the aorta are like, you know, branches on the aorta and gives blood to the kidneys, the gut, the brain, et cetera, et cetera. But the other thing is uh, thoracic, thoracic aortic aneurysms, they're real. They could be a problem if not dealt with, and that is a big issue for you and your team. Describe it. Yeah. Well, thoracic aortic aneurysm, more and more we're discovering because more patients are going to the doctor, or going to emergency rooms, they're getting x-rays, they're getting CAT scans, and we're discovering more and more patients have it. Years ago, patients just died and didn't know what they died of, or they had a heart they attack. They had no idea. Right. No one knew. Everyone was sort of categorized as having a heart attack. And now we're knowing more and more that these patients probably had an aneurysm. But thoracic aneurysms in general are a bulging of the aorta. And, and basically, it can be anywhere along that aorta, that garden hose. And where I specialize is mostly in the chest region. Uh, occasionally goes into the abdominal aorta. And that, those are more complex aneurysms. 
but it can be a real problem with the patients. But more and more that we know about these aneurysms, we can treat them medically, we can follow them for a long period of time, and we don't need to intervene on them. Doctor, where, where do they even come from? What causes them? In America, the most common is hypertension, you know, high blood pressure. That can cause? Yeah. An aneurysm? That, that is true. Uh, it's just because of the sort of wear and tear on the aorta, basically, the thinning of the, the wall over time, and that leads to the sort of expansion of the, the wall. Now, your program, it's interesting, the, the program that you run, the thor thoracic aortic program at Hackensack, it's a program that was transplanted to HUMC from Mount Sinai. Well, about a year ago, I was uh, recruited from Mount Sinai, and I used to direct the, the uh, program there, and there wasn't really a formalized program in New Jersey. Uh, there are centers in New Jersey that do this sort of work. Uh, Hackensack wanted a formalized program. What does that mean? It really it is a clinical program where obviously we do surgery, stents, et cetera, et cetera, but we also do research. We transplanted our NIH grant where we do research. National Institutes of Health? That's correct. Why is that important, by the way? Well, I think, you know, it, it gives us sort of the edge in terms of figuring out what is the best method or maybe there isn't, not everyone needs treatment for their aneurysm. And I think that's what we're, we're sort of trying to look at in our lab and, and, and also if a patient needs surgery or a stent, how can we do it safely? Yeah, it's interesting, since you mentioned surgery, and I know it's a case-by-case -case situation, mm -hmm. doctor, what would cause you and your colleagues to say that surgery is the best option versus some other option which we'll talk about? Uh, most emergencies today that on the thoracic aorta, especially if it's on, right on top of the heart, so the tube sort of six to eight inches of the aorta above the heart today, as we speak today, uh, we fix with open surgery. That's sort of the dissection, aortic dissection, even aneurysm. Stents haven't yet been developed for that region of the aorta. Where we sort of go downstream on the aorta, we become more uh, likely to give a patient the option of the minimally invasive, which is the stent option. But for surgery itself, people who have genetic problems related to the thoracic aorta. So there are genetic mutations where you can develop an aortic aneurysm. There are. There are. Talk like, about like that. Like Marfan syndrome. That's the like most common Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome. What is that? It's a genetic uh, disorder that affects one out of 5,000 births. And it is a uh, genetic disorder where uh, the they develop thoracic, that's one of the things. There are many th or, uh, other organ, system, organ systems that it can affect. Um, but the aorta is obviously a major component of the genetic disorder where it can be life-threatening. So those patients, we tend to re offer them open surgery. So for those of us who, who are people watching right now that say, okay, I want to have an, a sense as to whether I'm a candidate or that I have, I'm at risk for having um, an aortic aneurysm. Mm -hmm. Could I find that out? You I mean, can. What do you find out? Like, what do you do? What do you test? Well, I think one is just go to your medical doctor and get a sort of complete physical exam. People who have no history of blood pressure problems, they're non-smokers, uh, they're unlikely to develop an aneurysm. Okay, stay on that. I'm not a smoker, don't drink, too much other than a social drinker, but there's a history of heart issues, mm -hmm. problems in the family. Is there a connection between heart issues and aortic aneurysm issues? There is, because there are some aneurysms, because heart issues, what we talk about is you know, cho high cholesterol leading right. to the blockages of the arteries of the yeah, heart. Yeah, because it's got to be something to cause the heart issue. Right. There are some aneurysms which are related to atherosclerosis, so there is a connection with cholesterol and sort of calcification of the aorta, which is sort of the same issues that go on with heart disease. Right. Am I looking for signs? I mean, what are my symptoms? That's the problem with aneurysms. They are That's the, the problem? Yeah, because they don't. They, they're, we call them the silent killers. How about my shortness of breath? How about the tingling on the left side of my arm? Well, the tingling on the side of the arm will probably be related to heart disease, like, you know, people who have angina, who have cholesterol but problems. But that's not this. No. You, the shortness of breath could be related to an aneurysm because it can affect some of the valves of the heart, which can lead a doctor to have, uh, or lead a doctor to 
support our test like an echocardiogram, which is right. an ultrasound of will the Will it pick heart. it up? It will. Let's talk about the candidates or the patients who do not go the surgical route. Talk about the programs that you have with your, you and your colleagues that deal with them. You have some specialized programs there. Yeah. Well, our, it's called a surveillance, what is it? We have a surveillance program. That's those patients. That has nothing to do with the NSA, right? And no. the federal government, I just want to no. clarify. It, that was a joke, doctor, yeah, go along with it, okay? I, <laughs> but it's a surveillance. What are you surveilling? Well, there are patients who have small aneurysms, so who where they don't need surgery right away. We treat them medically, we make sure their blood pressure is well controlled, we make sure all the risk factors. Uh, they're not smoking any f further, they're exercising on a regular basis, basically living a healthy lifestyle. And we follow those aneurysms over right. time. And it, what we've learned over, you know, over the last 20 years is that a lot of these aneurysms don't need treatment other than what I just said. They don't need surgery, they don't need a stent. Well, what happens to them? They just stay at bay and we, we just watch them and make sure they're not getting any so larger. So surveillance basically means monitoring, staying on top of, Correct. and if there is a problem... Then we intervene. But doesn't that require the patient to be vigilant as well? Yeah, that's, that's right. And, and those are those patients where if we don't think they're going to be vigilant, then we may do a preemptive sort of surgery or stent or something of the sort. It's interesting, everything you just described requires tremendous uh, participation, collaboration between the physician and the patient. That's correct. And that's the thing that you know, I feel blessed as, as a surgeon. Not many surgeons have a, um, a long-term relationship with their patients. That's a big deal for you. Yeah, I think. Um, we'll keep talking off the air, go ahead. You know, these patients in our surveillance program, we've known them for 20 years. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, the Ohlendorf Center, Cohn Resnick, the Fidelco Group, Fedway Associates, United Water, New Jersey's Credit Unions. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. There is a place that pushes beyond traditional thinking to take medicine further than ever before where science and creativity work together to give heart and cancer patients new possibilities. And researchers discover options for children who once had none. A place that proves every day that impossible is just an opinion. Hackensack University Medical Center, where medicine meets innovation.